Hey there! Welcome to LSAT Demon Daily. I'm Chris and I'm joined by Ala. We're both tutors here at LSATdemon.com. And between us, we both have a mission to change students' perception about reading comprehension. And so we wanted to get together and record a series of podcasts for the Demon Daily to help students improve and change how they look at that section. Yeah, I didn't realize this was my mission in life, I think, before I started teaching um, this test, but I found RC to be a really integral part of my LSAT journey. I think, you know, if you think about it, it's the section that has the most number of points. So you, you know, it's in your favor to think about RC in a friendly way. And that's our job here is my mission in life. And I know Chris's mission in life, at least in our LSAT life, is to get y'all to see that RC is learnable and RC is a really fun experience if you can be patient with yourself and with us. Absolutely. And, you know, in this class today, we want to show you how skills from other sections of the test absolutely translate into reading comprehension, all under the fundamental belief that RC is a section that can and should improve with studying in the right way. And so Ala and I, we both approached RC in different ways, and we read through passages in different ways and have different backgrounds leading us to RC. We yeah. both find it a section that we fell in love with. Ala, what from your background would you want to share? Yeah, so I'm a philosophy major from undergrad. Um, I'm also somebody that used to read a lot like as a kid, like, you know, fiction, like Harry Potter and stuff like that. But I was slow at reading and not particularly good at reading. English is not my first language, for instance. But uh, nevertheless, I went into an undergrad that was all about reading. Particularly, philosophy is about reading like a paragraph for like a month. That's kind of the pace of like reading in philosophy because it would be so dense and it would have so much um, nuance in it. And that's kind of where I came from when it when it comes to reading. Um, what about you, Chris? Did you? It's I know you have a very different approach to reading or a different background in reading. Yeah, and uh, my undergraduate major was history. And so in a history program, at least if it's like mine, you get assigned 200, 300 pages of reading, maybe to pull out two sentences worth of information <laughs> or valuable things to share in class. So yeah. I often joke it felt more like hazing than actually reading. And when we look at you know American education overall in our public schools, I think that's the type of reading that's rewarded. And so I quickly realized I was being rewarded by skimming, reading super quickly until I hit the LSAT. <laughs> right. And that approach um, got me in tons of trouble. Yeah. And I think also the LSAT tends to be this place where at least myself, when I, when I first was confronted with LSAT, I realized that I wasn't particularly good at reading. Like to, to the point where I felt like, are you, can you even read? Like, are you somebody that can even <laughs> process information this way? And I know that there was, we had this discussion in class yesterday and there were students that were like, yeah, I'll, uh, I don't know if I could read before I started studying for the LSAT. And that's one of the things that, you know, I think we want to highlight together is to show you that you can learn to read. You can learn the RC um, as a skill and it's a transferable skill. It's something that's going to help you regardless of whether you decide to go to law school, but definitely if you decide to go to law school, it is invaluable to learn for comprehension. I love that, Alan. And I, I absolutely felt like I had to relearn how to read again, approaching RC. And it was the second time in my life I had to do that. When I was a kid, I got special reading assistance. I was not a reader, did not want to be. And the game Same. changer in my life was the Lord of the Rings movies coming out. And my dad <laughs> saying, you cannot watch any of those movies until you've read the books beforehand. And imagine that being the first book you've ever read in your life, <laughs> eight or nine years old. But again, that was showing me that I just have to read it quick. I've got to get through once I'm through, like that's all I care about. And so in this episode, um, we're really looking at helping students who love LG, the satisfaction of solving LG games and have difficulty in RC, finding that same level of satisfaction and feeling like they're solvable. So really looking at students who can read through the passage, but then have trouble articulating understanding. 
Yeah, absolutely. We want um, we want folks to fall in love with RC, but we also understand that RC can feel a little bit mystical. It can feel like there's 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 nothing to hang on to. There's no support rails. It feels like you're just like free falling through space. And and we understand that feeling. We've we've been there before. We felt like you have. And so what we wanted to do in this episode is like focus on games and show you the transferable skills and methods and perspectives from games and show you how similar RC is actually to how you might be solving games. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons to think that games are straightforward to things that games make sense. And we agree with you, games are super fun, right? Once you figure out that, wow, there's only like a certain number of ways that this game can be played. And as long as I figure that out, I'm gonna be able to crush the questions, right? There's no second best answer in a logic games question. In the same way, there is no second best answer on RC, but it feels like it's harder to see that. And that's what we wanted to make this podcast episode for y'all. Yeah, I'm lucky in that uh, the classes I teach at LSAT Demon are logic games foundations and Real Housewives of RC on Saturday. I love that class. That name one. makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a fun time. And I always tell my students that LG and RC are your most honest sections on the test because they tell you everything you need to be successful. In my opinion, yeah. LR is a liar. It's lying to you. <laughs> it's trying to deceive you. It's trying to trick you. Whereas yeah. RC and LG are just trying to give you all the information they can. We yeah. just have to find the best way to organize that, hold on to it and figure out what the passage is trying to tell us. Yeah, it's almost like it's, I think RC is the kindest section of the LSAT. It's like the most friendly because they have to hide in plain sight. They can't, they can't take, they can't keep anything from you. And I say this in most of my classes. So I teach um, RC processing and I teach plateau pulverizer here at the Demon. Um, and both of those classes do RC most weeks. And I always say that you guys would sue LSAC if they put out tests where they didn't give you the information that you needed in order to answer a question. Now, that may seem like, you know, but all oh, I still have to figure it out and do the work, of course. But there is some comfort in that feeling, right? Place your faith in the test and place your faith in the fact that they don't make mistakes. They have to tell you the information. So if you dedicate your effort and your time and your energy into understanding what they're telling you, you will be in a good place. Absolutely. And I think the key there, Allah, as we talk often, is that understanding, which is yes. different than reading. And yeah. you know, if I were trying to be a physicist and make a, a constant law that we could apply on things, it would be that your understanding is mm -hmm. always just going to be your reading speed minus one, at least. No mm -hmm. one can understand as fast as they can read. And I think taking the approach that I am reading, not just to define words and figure out yeah. what sentences mean, but to understand why they are there. Once we yes. start thinking about that purpose, that understanding, we're yeah. really building points of view uh, and worlds of those passages and the authors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's sort of the idea behind my Sunday class, RC Processing. Um, when I was brainstorming for that class and when I was building that class, one of the things I thought about is like, we're not reading exactly, we're processing information and processing, I'm thinking about, about it like the way that a computer process in, processes information, right? When you are given a set of data, it doesn't mean anything unless it's like actually modeled into an infographic, for instance, right? Like I'm thinking like National Geographic infographics. I love those. My dad loves those. Like I love looking at those things for hours. They're just so cool because there's, they're communicating information to you in an interesting way, in a way that has significance. So that's almost what you're doing on, on RC. You're not just reading, you're processing for comprehension, for understanding, so that when you do get to the questions, you're the expert, you're the person that can be relied on to know what the passage did and did not say. Absolutely. And that level of clarity shows that RC passages are solvable in the same yeah. way that most students believe that logic games are solvable. Since we're likening LG to RC, Ala, do you want to describe our approach to LG at LSAT Demon a little? 
Yeah, absolutely. So games um, was the section that I struggled with a lot um, in my own LSAT prep. It felt like initially it felt like it didn't make sense. But um, when I started learning it the way that the demon, you know, teaches you about games, it started to make a lot of sense because what happens on games very generally is that there are, for instance, six things you have to put into an order and there are restrictions on what you can and can't do. So P has to go third. It could be a rule. N has to go before W. So these are all restrictions on how those six things can be placed into that order. And your job is to figure out how many ways that can happen and then go attempt the questions. At the demon, we want to make your job easy. We want to make it as um, as simple. We don't want it to be stressful at all. We want your job to be easy. We don't want you to have to hold rules in your head or any of that. Our approach here at the demon is to get y'all to build worlds. Worlds are essentially the different ways in which that game can be played. And we want y'all to figure as much information of, out about those worlds as possible before you go into the questions. So you can just be like, you know, which, which what options are there for the fourth slot? Could be a question, right? How, how many of um, the variables can go in the fourth slot? Then you can just be like, okay, well, I have like eight worlds here. And then I just look and be like, one, two, three. Okay, there's three options. The answer is C. That's how we want you all to approach games. And that's how we teach it here at the Demon. And we think, Chris and I think, that there's a lot of parallels between that approach and how we talk about games and our C. Absolutely. And to me, it's all a question of smart use of labor and your energy. And so yes. in worlds, just like RC, we want to front end all of the work that we do. And sometimes mm -hmm. we use an analogy like sitting on a roller coaster as it's going over. It's like first hump, right? Yeah. And that first hump is us doing all the work of making worlds. It's doing all the work of understanding POVs and arguments in the passage and who is saying yeah. what and why. If we do that work, if we sit through it, we work to understand at whatever speed we need to, then once we hit the questions, that's the going down part on the roller coaster. The questions become the easy part of these games and these passages when we front end the work. If you don't do that, if you enter questions in an RC passage without full understanding, if you enter questions in a logic game without doing worlds or eliminating rules, you're just going up slowly the whole time. The constant feeling is work. <laughs> there is no downward slope to reward you. Yeah, there isn't um, that sense of like ease or the confidence that comes. Like think about how you might feel on LR even, right? When you found out that this argument is a correlation causation flaw. If you figured that out, like think about how confident you feel and how much power you feel. Be like, I figured out what they're doing here. I figured out the problem here. It's a very similar feeling that we want y'all to look for in all areas of the LSAT, particularly in games and RC, is we want y'all to build the world so you feel that confidence. Be like, I did all my splits correctly. I figured out all the ways that this game could work out. Now I'm the one in power. I'm the one that knows what's happening here. And we want y'all to see RC the same way, where we want you to build those worlds for RC so that when you do get to the questions, you, you, you're you the one in power. We don't even want you to, we don't even want to say like, don't be scared of our seats. Just, we want you to be in the driver's seat. We want to give you the power as you go through the passage, be like, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to get tripped up by the questions. Absolutely. And so when we look at RC passages and we're trying to think, what could a world in an RC passage be? What are we looking at? Ala, how would you describe it? One of the examples that I give, one of the analogies that I try to give in class is think about yourself as like a knight in like Middle Ages England, right? You're a knight and you've got like squires around you and you're about to go and joust like there's a tournament going on and you have to go compete. And uh, the students that may feel scared of RC or may feel like they have to rush into the questions are students that are going to say no to the squires for any kind of armor or maybe a little bit of advice or some training, any, anything that you might need to actually go compete in the tournament. So imagine how crazy you would be if you did that in an actual tournament where you're like, no, I don't need a sword or a shield or a helmet. I'm just gonna go out there, get on my horse, Don Quixote style and just go, go for it. Just, um, I'll be fine in the tournament. 
that's almost what it is that you'd be doing if you don't dedicate time to understanding and comprehending the passage before you attempt the questions. Now, what I want to teach you all to do and what I know that Chris believes that you all should do in RC is to take the armor that the passage is giving you. Put on all the all the chain mail, put on, take the sword, all the all the information that the passage is giving you and armor up. Put the shield up, put the helmet on. And then when you go into the questions, then you're going into battle. Then you're actually in the tournament. And when a wrong answer comes at you, you can just be like, oop, nope, that's not it. That's not the answer. And you can feel that true power resonating through you when you do the work to understand the passage up front and you want to armor up. Do you have any analogies like that, Chris? <laughs> I feel like you're you're the analogy king here at the I, Demon. I, 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 I love your do, analogies. I do, but I, I might <laughs> steal yours probably because I'm just such a huge dork and I love like every fantasy series possible. Anything involving knights, I'm in. So I'm in for your Perfect. analogy. Um, I always use in my class this analogy of packing before traveling. I'm a horrible packer. I'll just get that out there. I am always leaving something behind so much so that like my family takes bets on like what specific thing I left behind. Was it wallet? Is it phone charger? Is it socks? That's Whatever. hilarious. So that always means I'm rushing through packing. I'm not packing with any strategy in mind. And then when I get where I'm going or I get to the airport, I've got to buy that like $8 tiny tube of toothpaste. And then I'm running back mm. and forth between trying to get things back to my trip, back to my suitcase. That's mm. the same experience of students on RC passages that enter the questions without being fully packed up. Being packed mm. up is understanding the arguments and the POVs of the passage. And so if you find yourself constantly going back and forth between the answer choices and the passage, trying desperately to find something you didn't pack, you're paying a cost, just like I'm paying a cost for that $8 tube of toothpaste. You're paying a cost in time and energy, and likely also paying a cost and probably not getting all these questions correct. Yeah, and you're not enjoying your vacation either. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's, I think, why a lot of students find themselves not enjoying RC. It doesn't have that same satisfying feeling. And so when we're looking at building worlds in a reading comprehension passage, they can look really different, just like they can yeah. look different in logic games. Sometimes a passage will be nice and give us two or three different POVs and arguments, and then we're like, okay, world one, this group, world two, this group. What do we have to hold clear in those distinct worlds to make it make sense, Ala? I think really it comes down to being specific and have some nuance as you're taking in information, right? You know, uh, I'm thinking about it like uh, I use the thesaurus all the time. I'm very bad with, uh, with my vocabulary sometimes, and I can't think of interesting words to use. And a passage, you know, might be talking about wormholes or something like that and say that a proposal is bad. A prediction or an understanding of the passage could start with the author thinks that wormholes are bad, right? Now, that's great. That's a good starting point. That's you understanding that the passage doesn't think all that well of this particular proposal. However, the passage is going to tell you specific things about why it might be bad or um, what ground they may be conceding. Like, yeah, it's bad, but there are some good things here as well, right? Those, th those are all perspectives. Those are all like bits of nuance that they will share with you um, that you're going to want to house under. It's bad, but here are some details about why it might be good. It's bad, and here's some evidence why it's bad. Right. So you're building that story in your mind, but you're building it with nuance. You're not just saying bad. You might come up with some synonyms. Maybe it's not bad. It's unnecessary. It's not as useful as it could be. Maybe it's based on some evidence that has been shown to not be true or some experiment that's um, that's been under scrutiny. Right. These are all examples. This is me using my thesaurus to find out specifically what I mean when I say bad. So. In that way, I think that world's analogy works really well, right? We're finding the different versions of the, of the passage that are all reasonable interpretations of what the author cares about. How do you think, does that sound like right to you? Do you would you add anything to that? It does, yeah. And I would just make another connection in that in logic games, we get clear indications about the world it wants us to look at. 
If yes. Jay is third, if the shipment is on Tuesday, if Marsha right. is in this boat, we right. know what to look at. Reading comprehension is no different, but we get questions like, what would scientists most likely agree with? Or mm -hmm. how would this population respond to that population? What we have to do in those situations is just like when we reference the worlds that we created in logic games, we have to put on our scientist's hat. We have to see what would they agree with? What wouldn't they agree with? That requires that before we see that question, we created the world of that scientist. What were the scientists' arguments? What did they base it on? What was the relationship of that world to another one? And we can use those as guiding influences as we approach the questions, so much so that the questions are really predictable. As soon mm -hmm. as we read them, if we built those worlds, we can answer. Just like in logic games, if we put that world where Jay is on Tuesday, we know what happens. Allah, how often in your classes are you able to answer the questions before looking at the answer choices? It's funny that you asked me that because that happened uh, yesterday, like twice, I think, or three times maybe. Um, it happens very often. It happens with students themselves. I don't even have to do the predicting. There'll be like folks popping up in the chat and being like, yeah, I think, I think this would be the answer to this question. On top of that, we predict questions sometimes. When we're reading the passage together in my classes, we'll be like, hey, that seems like an interesting point. Maybe there'll be a question about that. And that happens every other week. There's a, there's a student, I have like a, a weekly like ding, ding, ding winner for that. It's a recurring segment in my class where we actually predict the questions. And it might seem like it's a premonition or some kind of um, omniscient knowledge that we're, that we're showcasing there. It's not. Once you start getting good at games, you'll start noticing that there'll be a particular inference as you're you know, doing your splits or building your worlds. You'll be like, oh, I know that there's only three novels in this game. You can't have three plays, for instance. If that's a game and that's something that you've inferred, there could very reasonably be a question on that. Right. And in games, you'll notice once you're building worlds, once you're getting good at it, that actually tends to happen. And it happens on RC, too, when you let yourself feel like, oh, OK, this is just as straightforward as games. When you do that, you'll be like, that is an interesting point. Maybe they'll have a question about that. And you might be right. I couldn't agree more. And that happens in my classes as well. And I get so excited yeah. when I like read one of those <laughs> sentences. And so I've done some reflecting on what's typical of those sentences. How does it allow me to predict? And what I found is a lot of the times those sentences are exceptions to the world, concessions mm. that that world or argument is making, or the relationship of that world to another one in the passage. Sometimes they're points of agreement. Sometimes they're points where things diverge or disagree, but they seem yeah. so distinct and different because as reading, I'm creating that world and I'm sorting things under. And so sometimes right. the passage will give me something that doesn't fit or it'll show right. me how all those things can be true, but still there's something else. And that allows me to orient my world and put it mm. into the place it should be in the passage overall. And whenever I see something like that, I'm like, I'm sure that's going to be a question where this population would agree with this population on this, even though in the passage they seem so divergent, something that seems totally right. different. And then you get something that you're like, that's different. That connected them. And that tells me there's going to be a question. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think, you know, I've definitely had like students predict questions. I've had myself predict questions. It's really cool that you're talking about like what might be common you know, aspects of when we do predict questions. And I think I would agree with you. It seems like if the passage is like a road, those places where you might get a question are almost like turnings, like changes, like they're like, oh, take a left or get on this freeway or, you know, get off on this exit. Now, we're not trying to tell you to predict questions like you should go attempt the questions or look at the questions before or do any of those things. What we're talking about is the the level at which the, LS the LSAT operates and the amount of information they actually give you in order to handle the questions, right? They can't ask you a question about something that they didn't say. On top of that, they have to make it clear as communicators that something different is going on, right? When they do disagree, like when they start out and they're saying something very similar, like sentence after sentence, it's all in the same position. When they diverge, they can't just divert. They have to tell you that they're diverging. And they do that all the time. They put little signposts and say, you know, on the other hand, you know, they'll pull a little like flag up and then 
your job is to make sure you're noticing that turn in the road, um, that flag going up and being like, oh, you're saying something different here. I got it. I see how this fits or doesn't fit with the picture so far. That's such a good analogy because it requires an understanding of where the road is normally going. Yes. Because if you don't have a clear idea about your direction, any veering off or curve or something like that is just another data point that you don't know how to orient. Mm. You don't know that that's not the normal direction. And so right. everything always ties back to reading to understand and figuring out the purpose of why these sentences are there. Once we're able to describe arguments or purpose or POVs in the passage and what they're doing and how they're related, it's so much easier to then file those new sentences or see those uh, juxtapositions of relationships or veering off course because you know what the course is or what yeah. the course should be if the argument were progressing in the way we might expect. Yeah, exactly. And I would say that the the analogy continues on for like like main points um, of passages, right? Like every question in RC is a main point question. And when I say that, what I mean is every question will ask you what the passage said and all the wrong answers will betray the passage in some way. They'll go against the passage. They'll be irrelevant to the passage. They just won't help. Right. And in, and in, the, in that, I would say like, the main point is like the whole game itself. It's like, what are you doing here? Why are they talking to us? Why do they want us to care about this? I love that you said that. And I think, I think it really does come down to that understanding, that paying attention. Mm -hmm. So what we want to push students to do is as they read through RC passages, to do it with the mind of creating worlds and solving the yeah. same way students so often do in logic games. And I believe just reading a passage, finishing, and immediately looking at the questions is just the same as reading all the rules in LG, not writing a single thing down, and <laughs> trying to find the answer to each individual question as you yeah. approach it. It's not efficient and it doesn't work well. Yeah. You might get away with it occasionally, right? And I, and I think that that's probably something that maybe you have something to add about that, Chris of folks that, you know, feel like, yeah, but I can brute force a game. I can just, you know, sort of piece some rules together. I get most of them right, you know, and I think RC is one of those sections where you can sometimes get lucky or you can get by with a little bit of an understanding. However, you're not being efficient with your time and you're not reading for that true comprehension. And the way that Chris and I want you to read is to read to answer a thousand different questions about the passage if you need to. Right. They're picking about anywhere from five to eight questions to ask you, but they should be able to ask you about anything and you'd be able to crush it the same way you could on a game. Absolutely. And at some level, like you're saying, with a game or RC, the questions are irrelevant. We've yeah. solved the game and the world's behind us or we've understood yeah. everything in the passage from a careful read through. So there's no yeah. guesswork in the questions. Like you said, they could ask really anything. It's largely irrelevant. It's just finding the answer in the worlds that we've created. And I wanna push students to not go into sections playing a slot machine, like hoping yeah. that you'll get lucky and the number will yeah. ring the way you want. And if not, let's right. jump into the next and see. We wanna focus on solving, on understanding, yes. on being methodical. And the way that we're methodical in both of these sections is the same. We're taking all of the information it gives us, we're creating an image that represents the passage once that image is created, there can't be a wrong answer choice that is really, really attractive that doesn't match that image. And it's really indicative to me. A lot of times I work with students who will find that they can get two or three questions right on an RC passage by looking through the passage, finding it, looking for that element of support. That's the same as creating the situation that an if question asks about in a logic game. It takes mm -hmm. time. You're going to miss things that could be true. There's probably yeah. variability you didn't account for. You might have gotten lucky. And it shows me when students get those two or three questions right and they miss the main point of yeah. uh, the passage. They miss that yeah. first question. And that shows me that there's some level of understanding we didn't hit. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a question. This, you know, what we're talking about, I love this conversation. It seems like a lot of work. Do you feel like students are maybe not sure about the kind of benefits that they can get from an approach like this, maybe in other parts of life or their future careers. 
Yeah. And I think the skills you get in reading to understand, carefully parsing text, figuring out author's purpose and argument and why we're reading this thing, that is law school and reading for understanding everywhere. <laughs> if you are hoping to go into law school or any advanced program that is reading and writing based, and you feel like uh, this is a skill you don't need to learn, you're probably going to have a rude awakening at some point where hopefully you learn. But I would say put the effort in now. We have supportive teachers, great classes, an amazing platform to teach you these things. Take advantage. Start practicing yeah. now like you want to play later. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And I wanted to connect it forward because a lot of times, you know, students feel like, but this is a lot of work. What if I just, you know, do pull that slot machine, I'll get lucky and then it'll be over. Nope. This is the beginning of your legal career. Studying for the LSAT is like that first step that you take towards becoming a lawyer. And we want you to take this seriously. And there are numerous, numerous benefits to you taking it seriously. You're going to have a better time in your 1L year. You're going to have a better time as a lawyer if you start building those skills now. On top of that, I wanna add, Chris, that it's gonna make you better at stuff outside generally in your life too. I swear there was like a, a, or like a mishap I had with a, with a bill that I was able to figure out because I, I felt like I was doing an LR question I was like, as I was like reading through and be like, that doesn't make sense because you, you guys told me a different thing when I called you, you know, and you become a better communicator. I found that in you know, like personal relationships, I've been able to listen better right? There's a lot of benefits and general improvements to your quality of life as someone that's a critical thinker, as someone that's trying to get through life, if you get good at the LSAT, because it's a kind of thinking, it's a kind of approach to information. Absolutely. And I think, Ala, we wanted to put our money where our mouth is yes. a little bit. And yes. we wanted to work through a passage together. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So what we wanted to do was, you know, not just like tell you guys the theory of how games are exactly like RC and then, you know, just be like, trust us, it's true, right? We wanted to give you all an example. So we pulled um, Prep Test 65, Passage 3. Um, it's about blackmail. And what we want you all to do is hit pause on this video if you aren't familiar with this passage. Go ahead and read you know, read for comprehension like the like we've been talking about, build those worlds, give it a try. So pause the video to do that. And when you come back, what we'll essentially be talking about right now is we're gonna be attempting question 18 in that passage. So it's passage, test 65, passage three, and we're gonna attempt question 18. What we wanna do is we've read this passage. Chris is going to be passage B and I'm going to be passage A. We have built worlds, so to speak. We've built our understanding of the passage, the way we're trying to embody it in this podcast and embody it in our classes every day, right? We're going to share with you how we did the worlds. And then we're going to attempt this question and try to show y'all how easy it can be when you put in the work to understand the passage up front. So, I'll get started with passage. I'm just going to give you a quick overview and then I'll turn it over to Chris to give um, his overview of passage B. And then we'll dive into question 18 to show y'all exactly how easy this can be. So passage A of test 65, passage three, is about how blackmail doesn't have an adequate explanation of why it might be illegal. When I first read that, I was like, oh, we don't know why it has to be illegal. That seems problematic. <laughs> Surprise. And so, right, exactly. And I was like, I was super surprised. I was like, oh, please, can you tell me why it has to be illegal? And it goes on to say essentially that, you know, it's comprised of two acts that they themselves are legal, but we're not quite sure why it's illegal when we put them together. And then, you know, says that not having a good answer for why blackmail is illegal is kind of a problem here. And then sort of ends passage A with saying, but there is an actual answer here. It's because of this triangular structure where you're using the state's chip in an illicit way. That's why blackmail is a problem. So that's a little summary of passage A. That's essentially the world that I have built by understanding passage A for comprehension. Over to you, Chris, passage B. Yeah, so passage B takes us in a fun trip into Roman law. 
<laughs> which I'm sure as a reader can be jarring. U.S. Canadian <laughs> law, got it. It's in our wheelhouse. Now we're back in ancient Rome. Yes. But the passage immediately becomes relevant because it starts off telling us that the Romans had no special category for blackmail. So whereas in passage A, we get that blackmail is a thing, but we're not sure exactly why, right. we just get in passage B that Romans didn't look at blackmail as a thing whatsoever. And so as we're creating a second world like I'm doing here in passage B, we immediately relate it to the world that we've read before, because that helps orient us in this new one. So that's the first nugget that I pull out, that blackmail honestly wasn't a law in Rome. What they had instead was an evaluation of actions that caused harm. So it wasn't that I shared information about somebody and that in itself should be illegal. It was that the information that I shared was damaging, hurtful, brought shame to the party that I shared information about. And so we get an interesting caveat that uh, comes at the end of the passage that's critical to understand in that there's a special carve out. So we have this harm threshold when we look at damage to others for blackmail activities, but also if these disclosures, the truth that you're sharing is related to a government purview, something that the government the Senate was responsible for, interested in, then you had a free carte blanche to get it out there. The government cares about it. We're not thinking about the harm threshold. You can say it, which yeah. is really, it's interesting that the government made that law. If we care, <laughs> say it. Absolutely. If yeah. other people care, well, there might be some more rules. Um, so that's kind of like your get out of jail free card. So whereas in passage A, we have blackmail as a clearly defined law, and then we yeah. learn about the justification for why yeah. it's a law and how that's not necessarily intuitive. Yeah. Passage B, we get that there is no special category for blackmail, right. no specific language, that we're just evaluating actions by the harm they cause to others. And there's a right. the special carve out for the government and things the government is interested in. Yeah, essentially. And what we've done is we've outlined sort of like the main point of passage A and passage B as we've gone through this. This is by no means the full extent of the worlds that we've built, right? There may be a particular question that says, hey, what about this particular detail? Now, when that happens, we're not going to go and read it all again. We're going to skim to find our place in our worlds, right? To make sure we can refer back to what we've built so far. But we're going to remind ourselves, be like, oh, okay, I remember what this was. This was an this was a piece of evidence that was housed under, you know, this kind of argument that they were making about blackmail. So we're we're just giving you that snapshot of the main point because every question is the main point question, and we know that the answer choice will be something along these lines. But when it comes to a specific question, we'll be like, okay, well, what was it saying about this specifically? Give myself a little second to go to my mind map like Sherlock and go find it and be like, okay, that's roughly what they were saying. Yeah. And just like in logic games, when I create worlds and reading comprehension, I also take a second to think about myself. What are things that must be true in these worlds? So yes. from the POV of passage B, we can kind of play a thought experiment of if somebody was criminally liable for blackmail, then what would have to be true? Well, passage B tells me that that information that they revealed must have had damaging consequences to the party yeah. and that there was no significant public or government interest in that information. And so right. holding that, it really helps me synthesize the world of passage B. I know what has to be true in ancient Rome for somebody to be held liable for it. Yeah, I love that you do that, Chris. And if we were to extend um, that question in passage A, it would be going back to that justification, right, about the about using the state's chip. And that's always a good thing to do because you're, the way that human beings understand information is when they make associations with them. That's why in my classes, I encourage students to come up with examples, to think about like maybe like real life incidents that may or may not have happened. The more connections you make in your, like your actual neural pathways that you encourage in your brain as you read, the more likely you are to actually understand, to actually remember the, the holistic story there. And so we wanted to look at question 18 because yes. question 18 is having us enter both of these worlds and mm -hmm. be able to answer something from the perspective of both. So it says, 
based on what can be inferred from the passages, obviously we're in a reading comp passage, we're gonna use the passage, which one of the following acts would have been illegal under Roman law? So immediately reading this, I stop. And I'm guessing yes. you do as well, Allah. What do you think yes. now? Um, I love that you paused twice. You paused after you said, um, after that first comma, because Chris is just giving himself a chance to like take a breath and be like, hey, we're talking about something that's got to be from the passages. Infer is just a fancy way of saying they probably very likely said it or heavily, heavily implied it, right? Something they said in the passage, got it. And which one of the following acts would have been illegal under Roman law? Another pause, be like, okay, so we're looking for something that's illegal. And I'm going back to your general prediction under your main point, right? We're looking for something that has that harm um, aspect to it. Yeah, and taking that second to step into Roman world, we're yes. like already predicting. We're working on what the answer choice should be. Yeah, and so we're thinking- Before we've even, yeah, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, we're thinking about the answer choices before we've looked at any of the answer choices, which I'm guessing is what you were just gonna say. Yep, by pausing, Chris has basically probably gotten rid of at least two answer choices without even knowing what they are because he's giving himself a chance to be like, yeah, I remember what I read. I remember my worlds and my worlds was it's got to have that harm factor. Absolutely. And then the question ends by saying, but would not have been illegal under Canadian and U.S. common law. What are you thinking after reading that, Ola? Potentially, I'm thinking that it wouldn't be using the um, state's chip in any kind of bad way, right? It's not it's not doing that triangular structure. It's going to be something that's harmful for the first part of the question, but isn't going to have that aspect of like bullying anybody with the with the government in mind. Yeah. And so with that prediction in mind, we know it has to be uh, legal in Rome, but not illegal in Alabama. Then yeah. we can go into the question choices with the perspectives of those worlds to guide us. So. Answer choice A says bribing tax officials in order to avoid paying taxes. Yeah, this one I've got a problem with right off the bat, bribing tax officials. Um, I don't have any information in my world. I'm looking through my world in my brain and I don't see any information about bribery or bribing tax officials or anything related to that because all I know is about blackmail in U.S. Canadian common law and about Roman law. Absolutely, this is the equivalent on a sequencing game from one to five, if the answer choice said J is in New York. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that isn't even related what? to this whatsoever. Right. And because we have that solid understanding and prediction in mind, we can look at yeah. answer choice A as like patently ridiculous. It just yeah. is not what we're talking about. Do you wanna read through uh, answer choice B? Yeah, absolutely. B says, revealing to public authorities that a high-ranking military officer has embezzled funds from the military's budget. What do you mm -hmm. think about that one? So immediately I put my, my Rome hat on because that's the first thing we have to do. It has to be illegal in Rome. Uh, and in this one, this wouldn't be illegal because the public authorities have a vested interest in the military's budget. And so revealing that information is fine. It doesn't matter if the high ranking military official is harmed because we have that special right. carve out uh, at the end about the public interest. Yeah, it meets that exception, right? It's like, it meets that, it's good for us. Yep. And I also wanna note something that Chris did that I think is particularly helpful here. Chris isn't trying to answer the illegal under Roman law and not illegal under Canadian US law, both at the same time. Chris is making it easy for himself. He's just saying like, as long as it's not illegal under Roman law, it's out. Yep. Cause that's not what the question's asking us to do. So B's out, we don't even need to think about whether or not it's legal under Canadian and US law because we figured it out that it, that it doesn't answer the first part of the question. Love it. And then looking at answer choice C, we've quickly eliminated A and B with our prediction using worlds. Testifying in court, immediately I think, did I read court? In Rome, I, 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 I did not read court. To a defendant's innocence while knowing that the defendant is guilty. 
This feels like another red herring to me. I think C is wrong for the same reason that A is wrong. I think J is in New York. Yeah. Ala, do you want to talk about how looking at these as must be true questions allows us to eliminate ones like A and C? Yeah. So the reason, again, why we're talking about this as worlds is because we want you all to see that you can't betray the passage in any way. And that counts when that counts when you look at a question as a main point question, but also when you look at questions as must be true questions. On RC, every question is a must be true. It's got to be something that they gave us evidence for. It's kind of like trying to trying to build like on a foundation or something like that. But an answer choice that says, you know, testifying in court is something that's just not going to be held up by the work that we've done in understanding the passage, right? It's got to be true. And we have no idea about, we don't know anything about testifying in court to a defendant's innocence while knowing that that, def that the defendant is guilty. How does that I sound? That. that sounds perfect. <laughs> I was all in. Do you want to talk us through answer choice D? Yeah, absolutely. So D says, informing a government tax agency that one's employers have concealed their true income. The first thing that jumps out to me here is you're informing a government agency and you're informing a government agency about something that is directly related to the work that they do. Yep. It's and that a tax to me, agency about concealing income. That's relevant to the government. Absolutely. The government has an interest in money <laughs> and you're telling them that they're short money in Rome. Right. That's not illegal. Uh, whistleblowing right. like this in Rome, perfectly fine. If the government has an interest, it doesn't matter if that employer that you ratted on is shamed, fired, harmed, damaged because of that carve out that we identified at the yeah, end. Yeah, it's passage that exception, B. right? Towards the end of passage B, it's the exception that says like, it's fine if there's a vested interest in knowing this information. So it's wrong for the same reason B is wrong. Yeah. And realize at this point through the passage, I don't think we have evaluated Canadian and U.S. law at all. We have eliminated every one of these just on that Roman law world that we built. It'll be interesting because we know the answer that we ultimately select still has to meet that criteria, where in U.S. and common law, it would be allowed. But we haven't yeah. needed that yet to get the rest of these answer choices out of here. So we've eliminated right. A through D based on our world. Mm -hmm. Let's hope E is something we like. It says, revealing to the public that a once prominent politician had once had an adulterous affair. So remembering my world from POV B and passage B, our Romans, I have to hit a harm threshold. Right? right. And so for this one, this absolutely seems harmful. That yeah, it's politician a prominent politician. Yeah. Would be damaged severely uh, by this, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah. The next thing I have to figure out before I can say it's illegal is does the is there a government agency, a government purpose that has a defined yeah. interest in this? Yeah. To me, I cannot say that there's that connection there. I couldn't nope, make that. Yes, because it, it, it doesn't get to that exception. Oops, right. I was going to say, yes, it is a politician, but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's directly related to the government purpose, like we saw in the tax agency and answer choice D. This is something different. And so for me, I think I hit that threshold of illegal under Roman law. Ala, talk me through the world for passage A. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to add on that I love the way that Chris worked through this, right? It's It hit the harm threshold and it dodges the exception that B and D got away with, right? Because there was that, you know, interest factor in it. But it seems to meet the 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 qualifications for illegal under Roman law. So let's look at would not be illegal under US and Canadian law. So what they told us in passage A was that it's gotta have a state chip involved somehow, right? It's gotta have that triangular structure where you threaten someone using the state's authority. I don't think that this would be illegal under U.S. Canadian law because it falls under that group of legal acts that they told us, which is free speech, right? They told us that 
blackmail is kind of confusing because it's free speech combined with the legal right to seek money. But somehow when you combine these two things together, we're in trouble. And, you know, they were trying to figure out why that might be and gave us an answer towards the end of passage A. E to me falls into the bucket of free speech. You're allowed to, you know, say almost anything that you want. And it's legal because it falls into that bucket. And I love that you brought up immediately the state's authority. I don't think the state has any authority on affairs that the politician might have once had. This could be 25, 30, 40 years ago. I cannot right. imagine once that information is revealed that some prosecutor is like, I cannot wait <laughs> to get in there. Yeah. That's yeah. just not something the state cares about. So they don't right. have any authority you can weaponize in this way. Right. It's not like a, you know, a tax haven or something like that. It's not something that the government cares about. It's an affair and it, that, that can't be prosecuted. And so we conclusively eliminated A through D using our worlds and our understanding. E yeah. met the criteria we were looking for, again, yeah. based on the worlds that we created. We can know this one is correct beyond a shadow of a doubt that this yeah. one is the absolute correct answer. And I want to ask you, Ella, you're taking an RC uh, section. You read mm -hmm. through on a question like this one, when you've created understanding built worlds, how long does it take you to eliminate A through D? Oh my gosh, especially doing it the way that we did it, which is I'm just thinking about illegal under Roman law. It might take me about 30 seconds to get rid of A through D. And to confirm E, it might take me another 30 seconds, maybe if I'm being really careful, right? And that's, I think, you know, the point that you're alluding to is if you're feeling like you're taking up time or that it's a drag when you are trying to build worlds and try to gain that comprehension up front, you are saving yourself an immense amount of time, even though we don't want you worrying about time or speed, if you do want to talk about it, you know, at all, the best use of your time is to do the work up front because I'm like just breezing through these questions. Not only am I doing it, you know, with less confusion, I also feel better about myself. It's a less stressful, you know, less emotionally draining experience because not every question is coming at me, like is not attacking me. I'm not feeling like it's an attack on my ego or, you know, a uh, judgment about how good I am or my self-worth. None of those cascading thoughts begin because I'm allowing myself to understand up front and not feel like the, the question's, you know, going to devastate me. What about you? Yeah. And I don't know if you would say this in your classes. The most common question I get from students is about speed. How to go faster. Mm. I'm not finishing. How do I add passes yeah. for? Yeah. Speed comes from understanding. And understanding yeah. comes from reading as slowly as you need to. Yeah. That reading as slowly as you need to will improve doing RC mm -hmm. sections as long as you're reading in a way that increases that understanding. If we're reading through RC passages, playing the slot machine on the questions, hoping to see our score improve on its own, it's not going to work. What we have yeah. to do is solve these passages. And if that takes time, you're doing it correctly. Know that yes. when you're going slow and it feels like this passage is taking a long time, you're on the uphill of the roller coaster. What we want to show you is that downward slope through these questions can be so rewarding and so quick if we're good at putting that work in on the front end. Yep, because the questions aren't there to help you. I totally agree with you, Chris. Like the questions aren't there to be your friend. The passage, however, is your friend, right? And don't ghost the passage because you don't think that's where the points are. That's absolutely where the points are. Think about it this way. Let's say you were gonna debate between a couple of answers on question 18 or another question in this section. A minute that you spend debating between two answers, one of which is objectively wrong, if you had just transferred that minute over to actually understanding the passage, you would spend maybe even two minutes less on the questions themselves. If we are going to play the, you know, the minute game here, right, which I don't want you all to do. That's why we want you to focus on reading until you understand. And this changes from person to person, right? Like I love science passages, but I didn't like the humanities or the art ones. They felt like I couldn't, I couldn't get a grasp on them sometimes. And Chris might feel like science passages are the worst thing in the world. We don't know, right? So what a passage takes for me could depend on my mood that day, my energy levels, my general interest in the topic. 
So that's why prioritizing understanding matters more than the number of minutes you take or anything like that. Absolutely. And one way to do that, as we've been talking about today, is to treat your RC passages with the same mindset that you treat your logic games. So it's been awesome talking with you, Ollie. You have anything to plug at the end of our episode? Where can students see you next? Oh, well, you can see me in class. Um, we've got all of our classes over at lsatdemon.com. You can browse through Chris's wonderful classes, my classes, all of our other wonderful teachers here at the Demon. We work for you, y'all. We want to show you how easy this is. Um, I'd love to see you in my classes. It would be, it would be the dream. Absolutely. And as always, you can email daily at lsatdemon.com if you want to ask us a question about RC or this episode or just have any exciting news to share. Thank you all for listening. Catch you next time. Thanks, everybody.